Wonderful. Hi, everyone. My name is Mirav Fine. I'm here at the Jewish Funders Network in New York, and I'm really excited to be um, sharing with you guys today uh, the work of Joel Brunold and William Daroff. Um, as you know, uh, the Jewish Funders Network is an organization committed to connecting Jewish funders to each other to help them to make better change in the world, to make the change that they want to see through their philanthropic giving. Um, we, I've spoken to Joel and William at length about the type of work that they do and why they think that this is so important and how Jewish Funders Network members can benefit from supporting policy and lobbying and the ways in which they can do it. We believe that this is really close to our JFN value of responsibility. You guys all know this as Tikkun Olam. All of our Jewish Funders Network programming are connected to JFN values, which you can find on our website. Um, just a brief introduction of uh, both our speakers today. Joel Brownold serves as the Executive Director of the Alliance for Middle East Peace, a coalition of over 90 different organizations working in every sector of society, building relationships between Jews and Arabs, Israelis and Palestinians. He works regularly with the U.S. State Department, USAID, and the National Security Council and Congress on the needs of the peace-building community. Outside of the U.S., Joel has worked with national governments across Europe, multilateral institutions, and parts of the Arab world. William Daroff, who comes to us from the Jewish, um, Jewish Federations of North America, is the Senior Vice President for Public Policy and the Director of the Washington Office there. He was named the forward, for by the Forward newspaper as being among the most 50 influential Jews in America. I know him from Twitter. As the chief lobbyist and principal spokesperson on public policy and international affairs for the 151 Jewish federations and more than 300 independent communities represented by JFNA, William ensures that the voice of the Jewish federations is a prominent force in the nation's capital. William will be starting off. Um, he's going to speak for a while. Then we'll have um, Joel uh, follow him. If you have any questions, you can either chat them to me in the chat box. I will be the, the chairperson, so I'll be responding to them. Or if for some reason your chat box isn't working, please email me. I'll keep an eye on my email. At the end of both presentations, we will have um, a couple minutes, about 15, 20 minutes for questions. So if you want to chat those to me as well or email them if you're having any trouble, feel free to do that. And uh, without further ado, William, please take it away. Great. Thank you very much, Marav. It is a pleasure. Uh, as a JFN member organization, it is a pleasure for the Jewish Federations of North America to be presenting, and I appreciate the opportunity and look forward to hearing Joel's uh, portion as well, as well as uh, the uh, vibrant q and I hope we have at the end. Uh, and from the start, I would like to thank my two colleagues who are sitting with me now, Stephen Klein uh, and Stephen Wolf, who uh, work on uh, these issues a great deal and uh, for whom I am grateful for their uh, stewardship, and if the questions get uh, really tough, um, they'll send me notes. So let's uh, jump right into the, uh, into the uh, presentation. Hopefully everybody sees the slides in front of you. Um, the bottom line here is uh, most of you are with uh, private foundations, uh, and the bottom line is that all of us have a, uh, a right and a responsibility uh, to be engaged in, uh, in the process of expressing ourselves. Uh, but there are rules that apply depending on what hat we're wearing, whether we are a, a public charity uh, like the Jewish Federations of North America or a private foundation uh, like many of you uh, or a 501c4 social welfare organization uh, or an advocacy organization uh, like uh, APAC, for instance. Uh, all of us have different rules that apply uh, to what we can do and what we can't do uh, that are based on uh, IRS rules and regulations. And then beyond that, there's the court of public opinion. Uh, while something might be technically uh, okay to do based on the law, uh, it might not be something that uh, would pass with favor among our donors or uh, a Washington Post rule if it was on the front page of the, of the Washington Post, for instance. So looking at the different types of organizations, uh, as I said, uh, we're mostly going to be focusing on the private foundations, uh, which are most of you. Uh, and then looking at the type of activities that we can and cannot participate in, uh, there are three that I'll be focusing on. The first is advocacy, uh, and then lobbying, uh, and then thirdly, particularly apropos given uh, the election is 46 or so days away from now, uh, what we can and cannot do as it relates uh, to elections. 
So for private foundations, which again will be the focus, generally advocacy is okay. That means that private foundations can talk generally about issues, uh, but you cannot speak about specifics of legislation or ballot initiatives. Uh, those specifics, which I'll talk about in a minute, would be lobbying. So for advocacy, you can say something like, um, we should, uh, government should uh, spend more money fighting malaria. Uh, what you cannot do is say, uh, pass HR 222, which will uh, allocate uh, $20 million to, uh, to fighting malaria. Uh, you can also fund public charities that do lobby. So you could give a grant to, uh, to uh, JFNA, which is involved in this case, let's say, in lobbying for uh, malaria funding. Uh, but that, but that grant can only be, and I'll talk about this in a moment, can only be for the general support of JFNA, not for the specific work uh, as it relates to lobbying. And as it relates to election-related activities, which again I'll talk about later, uh, you cannot make any sort of endorsement. You cannot say vote for or against this person uh, or for or against this ballot initiative. And anything you do must be uh, nonpartisan. So moving to lobbying. Um, what can you do? Uh, what is lobbying? And this, again, is work that private foundations are not permitted to participate in, uh, either uh, by the private foundation itself or its staff wearing its private foundation a hat. Uh, lobbying is meeting with legislators or legislative staff on specific bills or other legislative activity. Uh, so for instance, uh, lobbying on the Iran deal uh, would not be permissible. Lobbying on a Supreme Court justice's confirmation uh, would not be permissible. Other examples of direct lobbying would be sending letters to legislators or legislative staff. So you cannot send a letter uh, from the private foundation saying, uh, dear member of Congress, please vote for uh, Senate Bill 3. Uh, you cannot communicate with the public referring to a position on specific legislation or legislative activity. So you cannot send out a note to, your, uh, to the world or take out a full page ad in the newspaper as a private foundation saying that uh, the public should call uh, Senator Smith to encourage support for Senate Bill 3. You also are not permitted to opine uh, on ballot initiatives or positions. So a private foundation cannot say uh, every resident of, uh, of uh, Ohio should vote uh, for uh, medical marijuana or against medical marijuana or should vote for or against um, the uh, ballot initiative uh, encouraging more uh, funding for schools. That is direct lobbying. Another example of lobbying is grassroots lobbying. And this is uh, a call to action. And you cannot uh, here have a call to action, which is, again, as I described, communicating with the general public or a segment of the public referring to specific legislation, encouraging action uh, through calls to action. So again, uh, the private foundation cannot directly lobby. Uh, you can also not encourage the grassroots to lobby uh, and, and call them to action. You cannot tell, as I described a moment ago, uh, you can't uh, recommend that people in the field uh, lobby uh, just as you cannot lobby. Now, what you can do uh, are generally termed uh, advocacy. Now, permissible forms of advocacy include influencing the adoption of agency regulations that interpret existing laws. So if there is a law that says that uh, the Department of Health and Human Services uh, shall uh, provide uh, vaccines uh, against smallpox, uh, and the Department of Health and Human Services has to put together rules about how those vaccines will be distributed and what's in them, you can uh, advocate with the Department of Health and Human Services on, the, on, on that rulemaking. That's once the law is in place. You can build relationships with legislators uh, or help grantees build and sustain those relationships. So you can meet with Senator Smith. You can build relationships with Senator Smith. Tell him about the work you're doing. You just can't tell Senator Smith how to vote on legislation or, uh, or on the specifics of legislation. You can convene nonprofits and decision makers to discuss broad topics. So the examples here, how to balance the economy, uh, how to do international development work, how to work on preserving the spotted owl. Uh, those, but again, those convenings are general and not focused on specific legislation. You can educate legislators uh, on a broad range of issues without referring to specific legislation. 
You can meet with legislatures to discuss the scope and impact of your work. You can sign on to amicus briefs uh, with, uh, before the courts. Uh, and importantly, you can train grantees on how to lobby, uh, on the sort of things that lobbying uh, uh, is, but again, without telling them to lobby on specific pieces uh, of legislation. There are more examples here that you can look at uh, afterwards, and I presume we'll be uh, allowing uh, folks to uh, have access to this PowerPoint, uh, talking uh, very much in the same general terms uh, about uh, the advocacy. Uh, but there's one bullet point I just want to point out, which is the very last bullet point on this page, which is attempting to influence any legislation or ballot initiative that impacts the private foundation's existence, its powers, and duties. You are allowed to do. This is the so-called self-defense lobbying. So for instance, if there is a legislative proposal that would restrict uh, the tax exemption of private foundations, which is what you are, you are able to lobby uh, on those sort of activities. So if they are, uh, again, self-defense for the sort of existential uh, questions about the existence of your private foundation or private foundations in general, uh, your hands are not tied as it relates to lobbying there. Moving to the next slide, um, what sort of, uh, uh, if private foundations are caught lobbying or paying for lobbying, they are subject to penalties by the IRS, uh, a 10% penalty on the lobbying expenditure, but much more importantly, uh, you risk with uh, repeated or large offenses, you risk losing your tax exempt status uh, altogether. Uh, so this is literally a death penalty uh, that your private foundation could be imposed by should you be caught uh, lobbying. Um, so there is the financial penalty as well as uh, the potential loss of your tax exempt status. Now, an alternative here, uh, as we said, uh, it is important for all of us to be able to express ourselves, to be engaged in the public policy process. And one thing that private foundations can do is make grants to charities that lobby. So your private foundation could give a grant to uh, to Joel's charity, to AllMap, uh, or to the Jewish Federations of North America. However, uh, both of us, actually I don't know if Joel's group actually does lobbying, but assuming do. that they do, you do or you don't, Joel? Yeah, we, we do. We make the H1 provision. Excellent. So AllMap lobbies as well. So you could give a grant to AllMap or you could give a grant to the Jewish Federations. <laughs> However, your private foundation's grant must be unrestricted. It must be for charitable purposes, and no part of the grant can be earmarked for lobbying. So you, cannot, you, can, you can support the general work of the Jewish Federations of North America, but you cannot support the work that we do uh, lobbying on specific issues. So um, the agreement that is in the grant that you do with the, uh, with the charity that does the lobbying uh, must ex explicitly state that, um, that it is not, that no part of this grant uh, is earmarked for lobbying. Um, and it's essential that you see the budget uh, as part of it, and the budget makes clear uh, that, uh, that no part of the grant is for lobbying. And so you see th these examples here uh, where um, the, uh, the agreement for the designated project uh, could include lobbying as long as no part is earmarked for lobbying. So for instance, if um, um, you're giving uh, on this page here, if the uh, project is a $200,000 project, uh, $25,000 of which is for lobbying, you could give a grant for $175,000, just not for the part that includes lobbying. Uh, otherwise, you would uh, have a penalty uh, that is here. So if there is a malaria education project uh, that is a $200,000 project, $25,000 of which is included in supporting a Senate bill on malaria. Uh, you could support everything but that, and it must be uh, clear, and as I stated, it must be clear that uh, no part of the grant is earmarked uh, for lobbying. Now, an advantage of funding charities that, charities that lobby uh, is that grants can be combined with other support for the public charity sharing those advocacy goals. So you and other private foundations could get together supporting the goals, the advocacy goals uh, to move this uh, forward. And it's a way that you can be in the game uh, of supporting, in this case, of supporting work on malaria uh, or supporting the work that Jewish federations do on, uh, on Holocaust survivor education or supporting the work that AllMap does uh, on um, 
uh, trying to uh, bring about uh, peace in the Middle East and trying to bring about reconciliation. Um, private, uh, as well, public charities already have the expertise and connections uh, in these areas, and so you're not uh, duplicating uh, effort as it relates to that. So I encourage private foundations to be involved in this. It's just that there are rules uh, that uh, you have to abide by, uh, and this is an excellent way for private foundations to be involved uh, in this game and supporting wider advocacy goals, uh, supporting uh, charities that lobby, uh, but doing so in a careful way. Um, as a note, uh, public charities are required to have a 501H election. Uh, the sort of bottom line here is that uh, the tax code limits the amount of lobbying that a public charity can do uh, to an insubstantial amount of the overall activity. Uh, most of you are not with uh, public charities, so I'm not going to go uh, in depth here. Uh, however, uh, it is important that uh, while it's not required that public charities make a 501H election, um, it uh, is important that um, we, uh, uh, those of you who are public charities, recognize that there are limitations to the amount of, of lobbying that a public charity uh, can do. Um, this next uh, chart just shows for public charities um, the, uh, the amount of work that a public charity can do on lobbying, um, and we can talk about that in the Q&A if there are questions about um, the size uh, that you are. You'll see if you look at, I'm sure most of us look at 990s all the time, uh, if you look at a Form 990, you will often see uh, the uh, 501H election, which is there, and the amount of money uh, that this public charity is spending uh, on lobbying. Let me slide to uh, talk about election-related activities. Some of you may have noticed that there is an election uh, going on as we speak. Um, the 501C3 uh, organizations, uh, including private foundations, private foundations and public fa charities are both 501C3s, are prohibited from engaging in any activity that directly or indirectly supports or opposes a candidate for public office. So uh, this is uh, any sort of candidate at any level, uh, federal candidate, state level, local election, uh, and as well as international candidates. So you cannot, uh, as a public charity, uh, work for uh, the support of, uh, of Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, or the opposition to President Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, or any other um, uh, international candidate with your private foundation uh, or public charity funds. Uh, there is a facts and circumstances test uh, that uh, the rules that the, that, uh, the IRS will look at uh, to assess uh, whether you are uh, directly or indirectly supporting um, that candidate. Now, some things you can do is, um, is work on uh, hosting uh, debates or forums. A, uh, a C3, a, a public charity can work on a ballot initiative. A private foundation, as I said before, cannot work on a ballot initiative. So for most of you that are private foundations, uh, you cannot get involved, as I said before, in whether Ohio should have medical marijuana or not. Uh, public charities can. But moving forward, you can host debates or forums. There are all sorts of rules about that to make sure that it's, it's nonpartisan. You can't just uh, invite uh, the Republicans and not invite the Democrats, for instance, uh, and there are rules about uh, Libertarians and Green Party folks, so if you are going to do that, talk to your election lawyer. Same with voter registration drives. Uh, you are allowed to host them and fund them, uh, although there are some special rules about them. You can host information sessions. You can have non-political appearances of people who happen to be on the ballot. So the governor uh, who happens to be on the ballot uh, can come to your event to talk about um, malaria, uh, but uh, he or she cannot be referred to as a candidate for public office. They can't make note of the fact that they're on the ballot. Uh, and if you are going to do this, uh, particularly 40, 50 days before the election, uh, I would suggest you talk to an election lawyer just to make sure that you are um, tiptoeing on the right side uh, of the law, as well as looking at appearances uh, as well. Uh, you can advocate on issues, as we talked about before, general uh, issues. Uh, and you can distribute balanced legislative scorecards. So you can put together a scorecard of how the candidates uh, or elected officials have been uh, have uh, expressed themselves uh, on the issues of the day. Again, there are specific rules, though, to make sure that you're not uh, uh, actually putting your thumb on the scale or perceived as putting uh, your thumb on the scale. Clear election don'ts. You cannot endorse candidates for public office. 
You cannot mail information supporting a candidate. You cannot host or participate as the 501C, as the public charity or private foundation in the fundraising event. You cannot distribute partisan voter guides. You cannot provide mailing lists to a singular candidate at a low cost. You cannot link organiza your organization website to anything supporting uh, a, uh, a candidate uh, for public office. Uh, so to conclude, um, if there are real big questions, uh, talk to your uh, election lawyer. We are all three here in the room lawyers, but we're not your lawyer. Uh, and, uh, and you should uh, just note that uh, uh, there is a smell test here. Uh, if you are uh, inviting the governor who is in a, uh, in a huge re-election campaign uh, to your 1,000-person annual meeting, uh, and it's 10 days before the election, uh, I would think twice about it. While it might be permissible, uh, it's not something that, uh, uh, it's something you might get into trouble in for appearances. Uh, but beyond that, the bottom line is that private foundations should be involved in advocacy. Uh, there are ways to do so, to be involved in lobbying by funding uh, organizations, uh, public charities that do it, but while again, uh, making sure that there's no earmark for lobbying activities. Very happy to turn uh, the uh, PowerPoint over uh, to Joel and looking forward to Q&A. And again, uh, thank you, Marav and JFN, for this opportunity. Um, so thanks, JFN. And to William, it's really a pleasure to do a presentation with you. Um, it's a good opportunity to take the general that uh, William just laid out and put it into a specific context. So ALMAP that I run is a coalition of nearly 100 different nonprofits. Um, and uh, we act almost like a trade association. We're a 501c3 um, that, as William said, we make the H1 provision, which enables us to spend a proportion of our programmatic income on lobbying. And we have uh, Jewish foundational support, uh, but in every case, in some cases, foundations who make us grants specifically say this cannot be used for lobbying. And in other cases, they just give us general unrestricted support and look at our 990 and H1 provision to make sure that we're accountable to the law. So we're a good example that if you did want to fund lobbying activity, um, if you gave us an unrestricted grant, if you were agreeing with what we were lobbying for, we're, we're an avenue in which you can do that. So what do we do? So I'm going to, over the next 15 minutes, walk you through the different federal programs that exist that support civil society work in Israel. Um, there are multiple different streams that the U.S. government through USAID, which is how it distributes international aid, and the State Department uh, that has the embassy in Jerusalem and the, con the embassy in Tel Aviv and the consulate in Jerusalem spend taxpayers' money on programs that members of the Jewish community and the Jewish funders network also support. But there is not a large awareness of what these programs are. So um, my aim over the next sort of 10 minutes is to try and educate you uh, on what these programs are uh, and how your grantees uh, can benefit and you can leverage your federal taxpayers' dollars. Um, so the main, one of the main things that OMEP created through our lobbying uh, of Congress is USAID's Conflict Management and Mitigation Grant Program, or CMM. Um, since 2004, um, the program has committed over $90 million on people-to-people -people programs between Jews and Arabs, Israelis and Palestinians. Um, the actual global pot is $230 million, but all that through the creation of the program that we work in the House and the Senate have created a carve-out that guarantees at least $10 million a year goes to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Of that $10 million, 30% goes to shared society. So that's programs that are working between Jews and Arabs within the Green Line of Israel. So um, while there are very few Jewish funders funding Israeli-Palestinian work, there's many, many funders, including federations, the Social Bench Fund, and others that fund Jewish-Arab cooperative activities. Just uh, as a note, between 2004 and 2014, the U.S. government through this program has spent over $25 million on shared society. If we just look, like, uh, look at Hand in Hand, which is a uh, bilingual school system in Israel, they just by themselves have received over $3.4 million from the federal government. So these are significant grants. Um, the grant uh, portfolio, what happens is annually, USAID will put out a call for proposals locally through the USAID mission in Tel Aviv. Um, you can either apply for a small milestone grant, so if you have a grantee 
who needs to build their capacity and sort of looking to support for a, for a conference or for a specific program, they can apply for a grant between fifty and a hundred thousand um, dollars. And then there are seven large grants between eight hundred thousand and one point two million dollars that are normally distributed over twenty four to thirty six months. Um, the NGOs, as I say, directly apply to USAID. Uh, it's a five page concept made to kick off, and then there are fuller applications for larger grants that are invited to the second round. Um, just if you're interested as funders, this isn't something actually that the president asked for. It's something that is created through the legislative process in Congress, which is where OMEP comes in. Uh, we do all of the lobbying and advocacy for that work, uh, working by parts and by camera. Um, and also important to note, um, the cross-border grants are subject to USAID vetting. What that means is any recipient of a USAID program that does Israeli-Palestinian work Every participant in that program is pushed through CIA um, and other security vetting files. So if you, if you are worried about spending money on cross-border work, the, the stamp of approval that USAID can give to it demonstrates it's gone through all the security vetting. So if you are looking to get involved in the space but were worried about the risk given political uncertainty and security dynamics, you can see this as sort of a kosher stamp from USAID. Another program that exists that it's important to know about is ASHA, which is the American Schools and Hospitals Abroad. Every year, um, the USAID has $23 million for global programs that support schools and libraries um, that are sponsored by U.S. citizens. So what does that mean? So Friends of Hebrew U, Friends of Shari Tzedek, all of the different Friends of groups of either schools or hospitals have an opportunity to apply for these programs. Um, the awards are up to $2 million, and looking through the list, pretty much every hospital in Israel and university, um, and also some in the ab sector, um, have managed to win awards through this program. Um, these actually do enable funding for capital projects or equipment needs. Um, so if you are looking to buy a new MRI machine that could help uh, give access to scans uh, to a wider population, it's a program you can look at. Uh, they like seeing this leveraged, so this wouldn't be a complete capital campaign, but it can be something you can leverage off other things. Um, and it's just an interesting program that many of the Friends of groups take advantage of and should be something that you look at. Um, in their new strategic plan that was just created, they are looking also that these entities can help build a stronger civil society. So if you link it to a civil society goal, it's something that USAID is also looking towards. Moving outside of USAID, um, the State Department has a uh, pan-Middle East program that is called the Middle East Partnership Initiative, MEPI, um, that was created during the Bush administration, and generally is a budget between 60 and $70 million that is distributed across the Middle East and North Africa. So if we focus just down to the Israelis and Palestinians, both the U.S. Embassy and the U.S. Consulate have roughly half a million dollars to spend on local MEPI projects. Um, unlike the CMM portfolio that I described before that focuses on people-to-people -people work, MEPI projects generally focus on social or economic issues. Um, some recent recipients are groups like Sofen that plays uh, Arab citizens of Israel into high-tech and groups like Ajik Nisbid that have helped do Bedouin um, economic work. Uh, and that's the sort of stuff that MEPI likes to fund. So annually, there'll roughly be around half a million dollars in local calls. In addition, there are larger grants of around $1 to $3 million that will be run from Washington that are competitions across the entire Middle East. Um, you'll need to look out, the all grantees will need to look out for when those calls for proposals go up and what the topic are. Sometimes they're things like high tech, sometimes they're health, sometimes it's women empowerment, and that enables you to compete for far larger grants uh, across the region. Um, Israel uh, received four of those grants over the past two years, so normally they don't give the same country uh, the same grant, but every year the sort of call will be different. Um, Congress, uh, oh, it's important to note that on the USAID spending on CMM, Congress signs every single check, and everything needs to be sent up to Capitol Hill before it's signed off. So um, there's lots of uh, checks and balances in the system. And with the State Department as well, before the grants are distributed, uh, Congress will want to sign off on those grants. So um, if you've been having a run of bad press or if there's controversy around uh, a grantee, that can sometimes slow or even prevent the process from moving forward. 
And that's where groups, if you feel like you're being unfairly maligned, should be going up to Capitol Hill and educating lawmakers about the work you're doing. Um, another category of grants, and I think with this one I'm finished, um, is public diplomacy grants. So um, the U.S. Embassy and the U.S. Consulate, the embassy focused in Israel and the consulate focused on the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and Gaza, um, have money for public diplomacy, where the main focus is funding cultural programs that link uh, the American people to either the Palestinians or the Israelis. Um, money for this can be used for cultural exchanges, visitor programs, Fulbright are all run out of this. A good example, if you've got a good relationship with some celebrities or with some sports people and you want to bring them over to Israel to talk about, you know, and do some basketball programs, it's a good opportunity to work with the U.S. Embassy or the U.S. Consulate, depending on where you're putting them, to see if they can co-finance a program like that or help fund for a conference or an event. Um, the grants are small, between 30 to 50K, and can support anything from conferences to cultural figures to anything else. They're part of the core State Department um, uh, uh, .4 account, which is public diplomacy. So it's all really overseen by either the Consul General or the Ambassador, and there's no really congressional oversight unless something goes very wrong. Um, so that's sort of an overview of sort of the amount of money. If we add it up together, we're looking at roughly, if there's three from there and 10 from there, you know, there's almost $15 million out there roughly annually in U.S. government contributions that, you know, can be spent either on, you know, roughly on civil society activities that can uh, occur uh, either uh, between Israel citizens or between Israelis and Palestinians and Jordanians. And it's something that people should look towards. So what's the role of OMEP in all of this? So uh, going back to the USAID program, which is the largest grant, that exists because of OMEP and the work that we do. Um, we sustain it, and despite cuts to the rest of the federal budget, it's never been cut since its establishment. And that's a lot of our lobbying work that we do uh, on an annual basis, in addition to some additional work that we do trying to push a uh, different piece of legislation. Um, I'll pause there uh, and sort of pass it back to Mera for questions or comments. Hi there. Thank you all for for all of this great information. I've learned so much listening to both of you. We've had a couple of questions come in, both via email and through the chat. So I'm just going to start from uh, the first one that I got. Um, one participant asked, um, could the speakers speak about where nonprofits and grassroots orgs fit on the spectrum of organizations? Um, sure. Uh, and also, uh, Aaron Peterson has sent me uh, a couple questions, I think, one-on-one -on -one that I can deal with when, when you want to, Mirage. Sure. Uh, so there are uh, literally about 20 different 501C organizations, categories of organizations. Uh, public charities and private foundations uh, are obviously 501C3s. Uh, we talked about 501C4s, which are basically advocacy organizations. Um, the there are uh, labor unions and social clubs, and uh, like the NFL is a 501c6, for instance. Uh, the distinction is that 501c3s, the public charities and private foundations, uh, are the only uh, types of organizations where the donors get a tax deduction for making a contribution to them. Uh, what makes them all common together is that they're all tax exempt. None of them pay a federal income tax on their charitable activities. Um, so those are the types of organizations, uh, and I think that's the, uh, what the question is getting at. I uh, and most, I, I think if people aren't so clear, most nonprofits, at least in the United States, are 501c3s if they can accept those charitable contributions. And Flo, like William said, about the H1 provisions and other things as he put in this presentation. And, and one, one quick addition is uh, churches and religious organizations uh, are treated as though they are 501c3s. Um, so uh, your, your local synagogue, Temple uh, Beth Shalom, is treated as though it is a C3. Uh, some of them file a 990 uh, and have C3 status. However, because of church-state uh, reasons, they're not actually required to do so. Uh, but they're treated as C3s where both they're tax-exempt and contributions to them are tax-deductible, a, a like, purely religious entity. Like... Uh, uh, the Orthodox Union or your local synagogue. And then do you want me to 
mention Aaron's two questions here, Marav? I think I got them too. Um, oh, okay. I have one. What if other partisan sites have linked to our website? Um, uh, yeah, so on, on that one, what if other partisan sites have linked to our website? So for instance, let's say that uh, Hillary Clinton uh, says uh, Donald Trump doesn't believe in global warming. Uh, here's a link to the uh, Sierra Club, uh, which shows that uh, global warming is really bad and that Donald Trump is full of baloney. Uh, that is fine as far as the Sierra Club is concerned. What would not be fine would be for the Sierra Club to say, uh, Hillary Clinton is a champion on global warming. Here's a link to her website. Uh, the one-way relationship of the candidate or the partisan operation linking to the charity is fine. What's not fine is the flip side of that, uh, which is where uh, we as charities link to a specific uh, candidate. That being said, uh, Rock the Vote uh, or any of our charities uh, could say, uh, you should go vote. Here's a link to Hillary Clinton's website. Here's a link to Donald Trump's website. You'd need to talk to your lawyer about whether you want to link to Gary Johnson, the Libertarian, and Jill Stein, uh, the, uh, the Green Party candidate. Uh, we don't need to get into that. Uh, but basically, uh, nonpartisan education, like having the forum, is fine. Uh, and in the example that Aaron gives, uh, where it's one way, they linking, the candidate linking to us is, is kosher. Uh, it's the flip side that's not kosher. Got it. And we had one more. Uh, we often receive emails to foundation email addresses that include lobbying and political content. Is there anything else we should do besides simply delete it and not forward it anywhere else? Uh, yeah, I would uh, – uh, no, I, I don't think, uh, you know, if you want to – if it's really um, – I don't think it's something to worry about. Um, you, uh, if you're particularly sensitive about the issue, um, like you're under a microscope, uh, your, uh, you know, your chairman is now uh, – your former chairman has resigned to be the finance chairman for the candidate or something, and you're really afraid of a microscope, and you're tiptoeing around a line – uh, unsubscribe from those email lists and try to get off of them. Uh, but I think uh, receiving unsolicited uh, email or even being on an email list, uh, I'm on email lists for lots of candidates because I like to see what they're saying and what they're talking about. Uh, but the key is, again, that uh, you're receiving them uh, and, um, and, and you, you clearly, notwithstanding your status working for a private foundation or a public charity, uh, you have a First Amendment uh, right uh, to express yourself and to, um, uh, to uh, be involved uh, in the process. And so uh, just looking uh, at, uh, at materials uh, is fine. Uh, the key is uh, the dissemination uh, of them. Thank you. Um, one more. Uh, what happens in a meeting between a foundation and a 501c3? When the 501c3 staff begin discussing specific politics and opinions about political candidates, how should foundation staff respond or mitigate? Uh, I don't know, Joel, if you want to opine or you want me to jump sure. in. I can, like, I can give you an example. So when we sit with some of our foundation supporters, and they're interested in what we're doing on Capitol Hill, we'll go through the different offices that are working with us and for what reasons to give them an insight on what's going on in the lobbying procedures. Uh, we see that as part of our due diligence to our donors who are supporting us. Um, we're very clear on sort of that sort of work. They're not funding us. Um, that it's not the foundation specifically telling, you know, it's not them really getting involved in electoral politics. It's for advocacy or lobbying purposes. I'm not telling the foundation to pick up the phone and call this person because the foundation principal gives big donations to that candidate or anything like that. Um, so I think that in a general sense, if one of your grantees that you've been funding to do advocacy work or, or just a general grant that they also do lobbying work, I don't think you should, you should quickly poison the atmosphere by saying, please don't discuss politics in here. But if it's sort of unrelated and it makes you uncomfortable, I think you can mitigate it by just saying, let's not talk about politics here. Yeah, uh, I think that's good advice. And I would add that um, a couple things. One, that uh, both, you know, a C3, uh, neither the, the public charity nor the private foundation 
uh, should be endorsing specific candidates for public office. Uh, that being said, uh, nor should they use resources in the furtherance of said candidates. That being said, you can talk uh, strategy. Uh, if Donald Trump is the next president, uh, we're really going to have a hard time uh, with our global warming effort. If Hillary Clinton mm -hmm. is the next president, we're really going to have problems with our uh, 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 with our uh, with our immigration plank. Uh, or if Paul Ryan is, is not the next Speaker of the House, we do X. If so-and-so wins or loses, uh, you can talk about that in terms of sort of the state of play generally, the state of, uh, of what, the, what the world looks like and what America looks like. Uh, but the key is uh, that uh, it's using the resources of the C3, of either the foundation or the charity, uh, in support of one candidate or another. Now, I will say... Um, you know, we very much here at uh, the Jewish Federations of North America are nonpartisan. Uh, I call myself postpartisan, uh, and I have to work with Republicans and Democrats alike. Uh, and so when, and as you can imagine, there are lots of people who opine to me about how this candidate is awful or this candidate is great, uh, and I personally don't have a personal hat. I will uh, express that I'm postpartisan and that uh, we have to work with whoever wins, and I appreciate that they, you know, love Gary Johnson or hate Jill Stein, uh, but we're, uh, you know, that's not a place that we as an organization or me as an individual wearing my organization hat uh, would, would be involved or would opine. Um, and so, you know, the key is using the resources of the C3, either the foundation or the public charity, uh, in furtherance of the candidate for public office is something that can't happen. Uh, or, the, or, or the name of the organization as well. So um, your, uh, a member of your board can write a letter to the editor uh, endorsing uh, Senator Smith for re-election, uh, but they should not do so on the stationery of your organization, nor should they identify themselves as being a board member of your organization. Uh, if they do, then there can be an asterisk that says for identification purposes only, uh, but it's, uh, you basically want to try to keep your foundation or your charity uh, away from endorsing candidates for public office wearing your foundation or charity hat. So for instance, if there's a private foundation, Bill Gates, Bill Gates can endorse Senator Smith for re-election, but Bill Gates should not do so wearing his Gates Foundation hat or his Gates Foundation stationery, uh, and his lawyers might even want him to put an asterisk after it saying that this doesn't represent the Gates Foundation because he's somewhat um, inseparable from the Gates Foundation. Um, I hope that answers the question. Jonathan Horowitz, thank you for asking. Okay, I don't think... And I, would just, and I would just add one more thing I said before, which is the closer we get to an election, the more the microscope of the IRS and the public are on these issues. Uh, and so uh, if you are dancing by a line, uh, on a line, uh, six months before an election, uh, much uh, I, I would have much more caution about dancing on that line uh, six weeks or six days before the election, uh, because appearances matter, and and it would be much more difficult to say this close to an election that we're not trying to have impact on the election results, as distinct from say six or twelve months before the election when um, it's a little fuzzier. I, I just want to, if that's the last question, I just want to sort of conclude, um, you know, from the 501, from the charity or the grantee perspective, um, the IRS is very clear about what you need to do if you want to lobby. And the clarity that, that exists from that is, a, is an allowance, not saying don't do this and if you do, do it, but rather is a recognition that charities, just like trade associations or anyone else, have the full right to lobby uh, members of Congress in an appropriate manner, as anyone else does. And it, the federal, you know, the tax code allows you to be appropriate in the manner that you do it. So um, with all of the sort of parts and the, the, the IRS stuff that you should be aware of, don't make this scare you from sort of investing or working with people who are um, doing advocacy or lobbying specifically. Make sure the grantee at least knows what an H1 is if they're approaching and you know that they do lobbying. But by giving unrestricted grants, you cover yourself, and then the, the charity itself takes on the responsibility uh, in, in its programming and in its audit and in its own accountability to make sure it's, it's sort of relying on the law. 
Very good point. Um, and just a uh, uh, just a last point to Johnson's point because something William said really reflects me. The, the general rule of thumb that we play at all met because, like William, you know, many people opine to us about various different things. And given the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and outside of Congress, the competitions between different Jewish advocacy groups, be that IPF, J Street, APAC, or anyone else, we work with everyone. And what we always say is our job is to play the hand we're dealt, not to try and pick the hand we want. I think in foundation, that's what it really should be about. Talking about playing the hand that exists at any political moment is legitimate or hedging for you know, what the hand might look like in six to nine weeks. Trying to adjust what the hand looks like through getting involved in the electoral process is where you go into like completely territory where 5123 shouldn't be entering into. So that's the analogy that we've used with foundations and with supporters and with our own 501c3 members when they come and lobby with us. Thanks so much, Joel and William. Uh, I don't think we have any more questions. I haven't gotten any emails or additional chats. So um, this uh, recording will be sent out to everyone who is on the call, and it will be available to you. If you have any additional questions, folks who are on the call, uh, William and Joel, would you be comfortable um, answering those questions via email? Absolutely. Sure. No problem. Great. Uh, with, so, with, the ca with the caveat again that uh, I'm not your lawyer, um, but right. happy to give sort of general guidance and thoughts. Great. With, with the caveat from my side that I'm happy to be any of your grantees. So just, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, Joel. No. Okay. So, so um, if you guys have any questions, definitely let us know. Joel and William are more than happy to answer any questions. We're really glad that we were able to have this conversation, and uh, we know that this is something that is going to be coming up, especially uh, in the next, what would you say it was, 46 days until D-Day? Is that right? That, that was my guess, actually. <laughs> so, so with that in mind, um, I wish everybody a happy and a healthy New Year, and I look forward to being in touch with all of you. Um, and we'll send this around. And when you get the email from me, set, fill out your surveys. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank, Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.